Oh, no, that's okay. No, you, um, all you need to do is an introduction and then plan your point. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll introduce you this one. <laughs> email address on them. Really call, email, whichever way. <laughs> we do have a, we do a Facebook Live where we take questions. It's kind of an open, open door policy for us. We do not have all the answers, but as you can tell by some of the wonderful people that are here tonight, we usually know who to pester, which we are very grateful for um, the resources and the support of the various Orange County staff, Orange County Sheriff's Department. We are um, not met without challenges moving forward in our community, but knowing where to, to look for answers and moving forward together is really how we get there. Um, and I do really appreciate all the engagement we get from this community. I know I was here um, in the spring and we thought by now that we wouldn't be as concerned about the, you know, the, this, this COVID thing. I want it to be gone as badly as you do. Be good to each other. Be safe out there in your community. If you have a, um, a a needed community area that you want to set up the um, mobile vaccine site, we can help you do that. If you have any questions about the county's testing sites or other vaccine sites or any questions about that at all, once again, we don't have all the answers, um, but we're fortunate enough to be able to try to get in with the, um, the people that do. And tonight we actually have several presentations that um, will hopefully provide some updates and then we'll have an opportunity for question and answer. And, you know, I feel like if there's things that I don't, we don't have the answers for here tonight, that's okay, because that's how we work on it for the next time that we get together. And it just makes me grateful to have the ongoing dialogue with the community that's so invested in improving all the conditions for everybody. So I, I'm grateful for you, and I'm grateful for Lee for helping with this technical stuff. This is my, here's my embarrassing confession, that while Lee's here setting up all the technical part of it, I locked myself out of my office with my car keys in the office. Oh, no. Yeah, so really the fact that I was, you know, five minutes late was a miracle. So um, it's because security is like the problem commissioner. Again, I'll go and let her in. Yeah. So um, anyway, thank you for your patience with me. And thank you, Lee, for helping out with all the technical. All right, who's a... Uh, all right, Jason Source is next. Thank oh, you so much. Over there. Oh, my gosh. Thank you, Jason. Jason, if you could sit, stand in the middle, please. Thank you. Hi everybody, my name is Jason Soares and I work with the Planning Division at Orange County. Uh, my presentation is going to be real short, 
Um, we don't have a lot of projects or new projects, actually only one. Um, but first, before I get into that one project that's proposed, I'm going to just go over a few maps. Uh, this is the overall area. I'm sure you know uh, what an aerial looks like and where you live. Uh, so obviously, the, um, you're located south of 528 in the Orangewood plan development. This is the future land use map. This is what guides density. Uh, it's a mix of low density residential, low medium density residential, as well as high density residential and commercial. Um, you're pretty much already built out, so these designations don't really mean a whole lot. Uh, this is the zoning uh, map. You're in the plan development again, and this is the aerial. And we do have one project that's coming in uh, close to you. This is a Central Florida Parkway and Orangewood Boulevard. It is this, uh, it's like a little out parcel. It's next to the Bank of America. Mm -hmm. This is a 1,700 square foot fast food restaurant with a drive through And uh, it's already been approved by the Development Review Committee. So it's gone through that level and it's already in permits. So expect uh, that to be constructed here probably within the next six months. Uh, but that's really all that we have uh, as far as new projects in your area. So we don't know what it is, uh, but it's a rather small building. Think the size of maybe a Dunkin' Donuts. I don't know that that's what it is, but it's about that size. Um, so that completes my presentation. Uh, Public Works. Public Works. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, sorry. <laughs> now you have to try to make yours faster than his. Yep. Sorry. Uh, uh, looks like uh, some of the public work staff are not able to make it. I am. My name is Masood Mirza. I'm a county traf uh, traffic engineer, and I'll be talking to you uh, about some of the traffic-related projects which we are. Uh, uh, doing in, in, in this area. The number one, I know a lot of people are concerned about the Gateway and Orangewood intersection. It's a four-way stop and there are a lot of you know, people running the stop, stop signs and people are paying attention to the traffic control. So based on my evaluation we did, we are in the process of uh, uh, installing a, a traffic signal. Hopefully with the that with the installation of a traffic signal, it's going to make it safer and it's going to make it more efficient uh, at that location. And because I know, that, you know, we get several complaints about that that one location. So, uh, if you have any questions on while I'm going through individual project, please ask me. You know, I I am more of a type of person. Can you, can you stand up there? Oh, okay. Oh. When it's traffic light, actually, it's meant to be oh, because of that. Okay, okay, okay. Because I, I knew about it. It's my <laughs> habit of teaching in the class, so I, I had I can stand okay. one location. So, so are he asking when is the traffic light supposed to be installed? Uh, the sc schedule is right now uh, end of this fiscal uh, end of this uh, calendar year. You know, we are working towards the design, and then uh, the biggest hurdle. What happened to October? Sorry. So that's the end by the end yeah, of October. Yeah, October, uh, October, December timeline. That's what I'm saying. But that's not the end of the year. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's, what, that's The thing is, the, this is the thing. Once you make a decision uh, to uh, have a, uh, have a, any traffic control device, we have to go through the process of designing it and uh, making and acquiring the hardware. Right now, it, we are in the pro. Okay, we are in the process of. That the design is complete, but uh, the, the, it's going to be bid out, and then we are going to have the signal. Uh, just, I don't know if you guys are aware that when we, the, this is going to be a mass arm proper signal there. Right now, the wait for those signals, uh, you know, acquiring the mass arm is three to four months. So we are doing whatever we can do as a, as, as a part of public works. But there are certain things which we, we don't have the control. It, and so we, you know, it's, it's ongoing. It's going to happen. You know. But this timeline, October, December, was was tentative timeline, and that we are working on it. You know. So that's that's one thing I want to make sure that uh, and that the people understand. The next one, I have. Uh, 
is there was some issues at uh, the or, uh, or, or Orange Wood and the Central Florida Parkway because the way it is right now on the, the right hand lane is a shared to and right and that's where causing some problem and then you know we were told to look into making the, the rightmost lane at the right turn and a two lane and the left turn lane. We are evaluating that and you know the reason why it's, it's you know you may say it's just changing the pavement marking but the, if we do one one thing on one uh, on one lane the effect uh, trickles down to the other lane so we have to do an operational analysis before we can do a simple change in the pavement marking so my staff is looking into it and we uh, you know we are we have have the data and we are in the process of evaluating and and, and then we will see what if it is feasible to change you know, I cannot promise that it's going to happen because I don't know the results yet. You know, I know that we are we are evaluating it if because we don't want to mess up the balance of the inter other lanes. You know, changing one lane can uh, can affect the other lanes. So we we have to make sure that uh, nothing like that happen. Okay. What uh, there is another interesting. There was some issues uh, uh, about Lazy Lake. Uh, uh, and uh, in, I think that this area generally, uh, the rates are to slow down traffic. We are conducting a safety safety and traffic operational analysis to see what kind of traffic coming devices we can install. Some people think, you know, if you put speed humps, it's going to solve the problem. The speed hump, just like any other traffic control device, is not a cure for all. It has its place, it's, it works someplace, but if we put those uh, speed uh, arms or speed tables uh, without evaluating it, it can affect uh, several things, including your uh, emergency response time. Because every time you have a speed hump, if the ambulance is coming, they have to slow down, go over the hump, and then speed up. So we have, we cannot just put speed humps up one after another, because you solve one problem, then you, you create another problem. So we have to keep a balance. That's why people get frustrated. Why, why do you have to look at it? Why can't we just put it there? It's just a piece of concrete. No, if, if we do it that way, then uh, sheriff, Sheriff's Office and uh, Fire and uh, and, uh, and uh, what do you call it, first responder, you know, em uh, ambulance, you know, whatever, they, are. <laughs> they will come and complain. And because now we are impacting their response time, which is, you know, we have to be very uh, careful about that. So that's why, you know, I know some people think, you know, these guys are dragging their feet or they are not doing what, you know, uh, what we ask them, but we have to do it. There are other traffic calming measures which are less intrusive and less impact, you know, have less impact on the, uh, uh, in the response time. So we try to do that. And that's why if, if you call my office and you say, okay, I want a speed hump, we will never tell you that we are going to provide you speed humps. We'll tell you that we are going to look at, we are going to provide the appropriate traffic coming device. That is, and that is the appropriate way to handle the speeding, the cut through traffic. Sometimes we provide little traffic circles, which to which is really slow down the, uh, the traffic. Also, it's a safety. It has a very good safety track record. If you put, you know, because now instead of going straight, they have to wear off and they have to turn around. So it helps so the point i'm trying to make that we are looking at that area and we will be making uh, uh, some changes in the traffic control devices okay there was another uh, yeah gateway uh, when it approaches as uh, to central florida parkway then the, uh, the one lane and turns into two lane section mm -hmm. yes that is a uh, confusing i already have my staff uh, looking at it and we will create the work orders and we will be uh, putting appropriate uh, street uh, signs to uh, make the people aware that there is a change in the lane configuration as they go northbound or southbound we are going to do the thing uh, do the signage for both northbound and the southbound directions okay that uh, yeah then there was some 
uh, some uh, some uh, some other concerns about the beach line and some of the missing what I call it I think it's the technical word is delineator I call it candlesticks where people sometimes jump on one side or other so we will look into it to see if if we can provide some uh, some kind of appropriate devices to prohibit uh, the jumping from one side to the other so let me see what else I have okay okay this is something I uh, I have on my list, and I am going to ask you if you guys have something. Yes, sir. Um, on the Central Florida Parkway and uh, Orangewood Boulevard, all four, of, if you're in any one of those left-hand turns lanes there, there's only room for like about six or seven cars, maybe. And it would really help tremendously if, if we could maybe lengthen up all four of those turn lanes, and I think there's room to do it, to maybe 15 cars. Because what happens is it backs up into the main traffic. And that applies to any one of those four intersections there at that intersection. So yep. maybe that's something we can look at. Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, this uh, storage land issue is, is uh, a typical throughout the county because we are growing, the traffic is growing. When we, whenever we design a storage capacity, we design it for certain age, a certain growth rate that is, and certain time period. Sometimes, because of the growth, that the growth, uh, growth uh, it happens faster, and then we start having this these kind of issues. Those and, and we look at those things every every uh, the cycle. We do it, you know, uh, every three years. We look at, you know, we, one year we look at one 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 third of the county. Next year we look we review the signal timing and and operational issues like what you are telling me. And then the third year we go another, and then we repeat it. So we continuously monitoring it, and and those kind of improvements uh, need cap capital projects. It's not a simple operational fix. So we, I I, I will look, uh, I I will take it, take this in under consideration. We will look at it, and you know, next year I think we did uh, Central Florida last year. So when we look at the next cycle, we will see if there is a need for uh, additional storage. If there is a need, uh, then we will we have to program it, and then the, the council has to fund it. So it's it's a it's it's not a traffic op simple operational improvement which I can which I have the money to do it. It's it's a more capital project. Right, I understand. Thank you for explaining that, sir. Sorry. So thank you for explaining that. Thank you. And I want to say also, um, we're speaking now and actually. Walk the, walk the intersections, um, leave us enough here and on, and, and to try to really see some of the patterns during rush hour and see what's going on. And so they really are eyes out here and um, trying to make it's sure difficult. they're keeping up with it. It is it's a challenge, you know. But, um, <laughs> uh, uh, anything, any other questions for me? Yes, sir. Um, at the corner of Gateway and um, the Florida Parkway, um, for the left hand turning lane, I think what uh, would be really nice there is uh, no U-turn sign. There's no reason for anybody to make a U-turn anymore. Yeah, we're still going up. Yeah, yeah. We're still going up. They, uh, with the new cut through that's up the street, if, if you come out of even the Dollar Tree, you're supposed to be going around, or you can come out of Rikers. They're, they're just coming out. They're not waiting up at the top or using the light. And then there, there's almost an accident there almost every single day. Mm -hmm. OK. Uh, if you. If, uh, if you can tell, what is this? You said Central Florida? Central Florida Parkway and um, Gateway. Central Florida the Florida left hand turn to and turn onto Gateway. Right across the street from McCombs. Yes. That light needs a no U turn. We, we can look into that. Why aren't you going in Central Florida too? No, no U turns over there. And the light at McDonald's, as soon as it's green, the people make their left hand turn into oncoming traffic. Yeah. yeah. So, Ma'am, we we <coughs> traffic. Uh, we can do. We can put signs. We can restrict the turns. But believe me, it's no sign. If somebody wants to make it, only these guys can uh, <laughs> hit their pocket, and they may they may stop it. But we and we work closely with uh, with uh, with Orange County Sheriff's Office, and you know we can put five signs. You know, but still people. Uh, uh, do these things which put 
their life in danger and other people's life in danger. So answer, to answer your question, I will look into it to see if, if we can do it uh, in what will be the effect because right now I don't know the actual U-turn uh, volumes and if if we restrict that we have to make we have to see what are the other options are those the safer options or you know sometimes it's what well, they should be using the line mm -hmm. is what they should be doing there there is a way to get from Rikers and Dollar Tree over to the line they don't use it they would rather just pull out and then try and bang the Yui there. And, you know, they don't care if there's the cars turning, they don't care if people are in the crosswalk, they just do it. You know, and most of these people are not neighborhood people that right. are doing it. They're tourists. Yeah. So, we, we can look into that. You know, we will look, uh, we can look into saying, uh, uh, putting some signs. That's all I can promise. I cannot promise change in uh, uh, people's driving behavior. <laughs> Just like, oh, shit. Well, if you tell you that, that would be great. Well, let me tell you that. Thank you. <laughs> they have some power. They have some power because, because honestly, you know, the people ask me, okay, put, uh, if people are speeding, put more stop signs. If they are not following the first stop sign or the first uh, speed limit sign, why would they follow uh, third and the fourth and the fifth and so on? Because if they don't follow, you don't get a ticket from an officer. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah. Well, I was going to say, I think, I think again, it is a combined, it's a combined thing. So that's, a good design. Thank you, sir. That's why we work with the Orange County Sheriff's Office uh, uh, very closely. I have much speed, though. Sorry? <laughs> I have one. <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> well, they're actually next, so thank you so much. Thank you. I have one more question. Are the Indians available? Are the Indians still available? Do you yeah. have slides again? Oh, oh cleaning. 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 Well, they're, they're next. Clean the, they're the dishes. Next. Clean the ditches. They're getting high. Oh, it was up there. Okay. It was the first one on the Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so they need like inmates that. for cleaning. Um, yeah, right. I, really, I don't have any, 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 any. Yeah. Let's get back on track. Okay, I'll make sure. Yes, ma'am. All right, sure. Yeah, ma'am, you, you, ma you have some questions? Back to the traffic light. Yes. So, in October, you guys are going to start putting it there, or what is the completion? Okay. I keep hearing, oh, sorry, don't start. January 1st. For completion. I, at, at this point, I, I can tell you that uh, it is scheduled for October, December. If you ask me what you know exactly what date, I cannot tell you at this point. I can try to get you that information if you give me your contact information, or I can share with the commissioner's office uh, exact. You know, when I say exact, you know, it give me give me a few weeks here and there. Okay. I can give you a little bit better uh, timeline. But my only concern with that is I hope that they take in consideration of the school when they started doing construction a couple of years back. The school. Literally, the buses got so impacted because they couldn't get through the street. It was a big hassle. So when they decide to start this and complete this, I hope they're taking consideration of the we school. Are we have two new high school, I'm sorry, one new elementary, one new high school. We have another middle school being built. I mean, the demographics is completely changing. We, we, we are doing it at a priority. We are doing it at a, pri at a, at a priority level. So they, they did it we'll Awesome. Yeah, and if there's any more, she's probably really confident that they're going to be time. All right. And so what we can do is like keep uh, them uh, through uh, the agenda, uh, and then um, if there's yeah. any remaining questions at the end, make sure that we're connecting people. If that's okay. And so thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're very, very fortunate to have sheriff's office representatives here tonight. And oh my gosh, I'm so humbled to mention. <laughs> okay, I'm going to introduce yourself, but we are very grateful because, once again, with all of the safety issues, obviously there is, you know, we have to work very closely together in design and in planning and in enforcement enforcement. Ideally, we don't get to enforcement, but usually we do. So it's very good that we have as many um, outstanding um, sheriffs, deputies, and officers that we have that are really attentive to our residents' needs. I am like really, really grateful, and I want to say this, that sometimes I get a constituent concern, and I throw, the, I throw the thing out there to the world and put on everybody, and then it kind of comes back in pieces, and the sheriff's department is always the first. And I'm like, yeah, they win every time. 
<laughs> so anyway, thank you so much for being here tonight. Woo. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Joe Scutero, and my role at the Sheriff's Office is I'm a, I'm a sector captain or sector commander. I'm responsible for all of the public safety services that serve your community from the Sheriff's Office out here in the Williamsburg community. Your community, as you know, is nestled right amongst the biggest tourism community in, in the country, if not in the world, right? Mm -hmm. So also in our sector for our public safety resources is that tourism community consisting of international drive. So I'd like also to introduce um, some additional Sheriff's Office staff that are going to come up and answer, hopefully answer some of y'all's questions and share some information. The first, starting from left to right, Lieutenant Mike Crabb, he works in our traffic section. He's going to speak and share a lot of our efforts with you that and, and accomplishments to address the traffic control issues and the traffic problems and complaints that you have. Which, by the way, I recall being here a few years ago, maybe a couple of years ago, where the, the room was was packed um, with all of uh, your your neighbors. And the traffic study, if I recall, determined that they wanted to do a roundabout, right? And and your all's voices were very loud and clear. Um, I don't know if you were here for this one, but you all, the residents of the community, made it very clear you didn't want that. You want a traffic light. If I recall correctly. Well, it was. Well, the I think it was 60, 40. 60, 40. Well, it seems like it's been accomplished with the yeah. installation of the traffic light yeah. soon. So that's that's very good, very good. Um, the next over, Jim Bridges. Jim Bridges works in the area with with myself. Um, he's he, his title is Special Projects Deputy. He fields all of those not normal, typical um, community problems where we can help. He works closely with our county commissioners to put things like this together, get our resources together. To the right of them, in the very fancy uniform right there, the aviation captain, Tony Minnis, gets to fly helicopters. I understand there's some questions about helicopters. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so he'll uh, he'll speak to that. So before turning it over first to, to Lieutenant Crab to talk about the, the speeding issues, I wanted to share something with you all that, that I hope will quantify what you all as residents are seeing. What I've heard you all reference today is is the increase in traffic, right? So to quantify the increase in tourists, employees in the area, here's what's going on in your immediate vicinity over the past five years. In the past five years, in the immediate vicinity, just outside your community here, 31 new hotels have been built, 44 new dining and entertainment venues, 15, 15 new shopping venues, eight new office developments, business office developments, 14 apartment complexes, and four more hotels were added in 2020. In 2021 right now, there is a 157 vacation home community, 157 vacation home community on South, Inter on, uh, South International Drive, right near the beach line, that is, that is proposed to be built. Eight to 15 uh, bedrooms. So these are obviously vacation rentals for big, big groups of people to come over. And four more apartment complexes, and then most importantly, which will continue to impact your area, Phase two and phase three of the Violin Point Retail Center. That's all that growth on Daryl Carter Parkway over there. The uh, I think it's Coles, uh, Burlington, yeah. White, White Castle, the yeah. Northerners, right? And then O Town West. O Town West is going to be a 1,500 residential unit with retail and shopping and dining and hotel. So what what you all are seeing is happening. The growth has been exponential in the past five years. And that's what that's why we're here to help communicate to you all what we're doing about that. So without further ado, Mike, would you like to share all the wonderful stuff, a lot of, a lot of hard work towards this first topic right here, speeding and racing throughout the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, sir. My name is Mike Crabb. I'm in charge of the traffic section. I'm the guy that's in charge of the section you either love or you hate. Yeah. One or the other. So I either did a great job for you and you're like, you guys are the best. Or we were horrible and you guys are just stink, right? So let me add a couple, a couple of things for a couple of changes that have happened. First of all, there was a new parking ordinance that passed in November of uh, 2020. Um, and I pulled all the complaints for Williamsburg. And even though you guys complain, have a significant complaint about racing and speeding and loud exhaust, you have more complaints about illegal parking than you do about speeding. And uh, so I just want to make sure everybody knows that there's some new stat, uh, some new, uh, new ordinance language. One, you can't have a car under cover. Can't have a car parked in the street with no tag on it. Can't be an abandoned car. Can't have any dual wheel, no semi trucks at all. Uh, so if you see any of those items, I'm going to give you contact information. And I'm going to give it to Lee also. She's going to push it out to make sure you you get it, uh, the contact information, so you can come directly to me and we can address those. And so 
Um, so I just want to be aware of that. Anything you see out there parking related, since that's a significant number of your complaints, make sure you're forwarding those too. And at the end, I'll give you three contacts, three ways to contact me, and it comes directly to my section. So, so my section's in charge of the motorcycle guys who give uh, lots of tickets. Uh, we give, uh, I'm in charge of the DUI section. I'm in charge of parking, and I'm in charge of the dreaded red light cameras. So, um, so I have all of the fun stuff, kind of that makes people <laughs> upset. Um, but we can't have an impact, and we have had an impact. So I want to talk about first your racing issue, mainly on Central Florida Parkway. So um, we're currently running a detail. We've been running a detail for years, but um, we started a, a much bigger detail in January uh, where we were addressing uh, the illegal motorcycles and the racing. But a significant impact on that, and uh, you, you should have seen a little bit lower number later in the evening. When I was first running this detail, we were out till five, six in the morning trying to chase these cars and motorcycles around. And we average around midnight now where they've pretty much bailed out and they've gone because we've harassed them enough or taken them up to jail or given enough tickets out. So we are running that multiple nights a week. And that, that includes uh, uh, Captain Zacatero's folks in patrol. It includes our TAC deputies, our traffic deputies. It includes a whole conglomerate of deputies to try to address this problem. I attacked your particular problem with my evening traffic unit. So I have an evening traffic unit that, that does the same thing that Motors does, uh, except they only work at night. And then once they're done with traffic complaints, which are usually done by 8 o'clock or so, then they work on DUIs. I had those guys uh, specifically attack your racing complaint. And when I, and I've, I've seen, I'm familiar with your complaint. I've seen it. I, I was down here in Sector 5 with Captain Scatero for a little while also, so I know what Central Florida Parkway is like. And it's generally a cut through to go to the racers down on the South Trail. And a lot of your complaints were actually not exhaust and not actual racing, but we had both. So our top speed that we got, which we got just two weeks ago, was 107 miles an hour on Central Florida Parkway. Thank God it was at 2 in the morning and there was no traffic out. Otherwise, someone could have been seriously injured. Uh, that person went to jail. Um, and we wrote, uh, we've written a lot of tickets. So, and we worked mainly the outside skirts for the racing problem. So we did 528. Central Florida Parkway, Junion Parkway, and we work mainly those areas to make sure that we attack that. So you do have an issue. There's no doubt we know that. Uh, it's included in the area for the for the detail, the, the continuing detail that we have, and it's an open complaint in my section. So we log all our complaints, and we keep. And if it's an ongoing issue, we keep it open so my deputies continue to work. Looks like you have a question. Yes, sir, I do. And several of the neighborhoods right here in Williamsburg, if you drive around a little bit, what you guys do, you will see the markings of some hoodlums, they must have come around 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, they're doing donuts, mm -hmm. and as soon as it wears off a little bit, they're watching, as soon as it wears off a little bit, they come back and lay down new donuts, and you can see them all over the place out here. And to do that, they have to really get up some horsepower and some speed they do. to do that. They do. So we actually look for those areas, so we look for a multiple. Uh, There's a lot of that in this area. A lot where of they're doing donuts and things like that, there is. So here's what I need you to do. So. So my traffic section, they come down here and they'll work your area for a little while. And then, so my traffic section is seven deputies and I'm responsible for this exact thing countywide. So we could be on the other side of the county working the exact same thing. And you call and say, I need a traffic guy or send me an email with enough for the contact information. I'm not going to get that till the next day. Mm -hmm. they're, they're on the other side. That's something you need to call patrol for. So okay. Captain Scatero would send his patrol deputies out and investigate immediately and at least get a presence right away. That's the one you're not going to want to send an email on. You're going to want to, you want, you're, you're going to, and you can call 911 on that. They're actively doing either racing or doing those donuts and trying to drift. They're marking your turf. They are. And um, another good reason not to have a roundabout. And I just, you know, just to add on that, just to remind me, if, if there's a county service that needs to be involved, call 311. 311 is obviously not nervous. It will trigger the process of, of opening a case that basically whatever needs to happen, it can then kind of opens that case and then gets followed. Is that a 24-hour thing? 311 is out of that. 311's great. You can also have, they also have an app that works great too. So, But my, uh, for that particular case, I'm going to want you to call uh, right away because we want to get patrol here to get to either try to catch them and, and stop that activity immediately. Well, they do it in the middle of the night. You know? We work 24-7. So, so, yeah. so, yes, sir. Yeah, so I know the the traffic uh, engineer Telling us they work closely with you. We do. Issues. Does the racing and, and, and 
that sort of thing play into the, the studies they do on uh, possible traffic devices or lane expansions or anything like that? Um, so well, I can I can assure you that Central Florida Broadway is not going to get speed homes, and no. and that's and that's that's the main the main area. If we had if they were using Gateway or Orangewood significantly, uh, that that might be something. That they have a whole study with that. But yeah, we do work very closely with them. We work very closely with his with uh, with the South Section on no parking signs and how to help improve traffic flow, things like that. So um, so just want you to understand how how we work it so that you know how to apply your complaint properly so we get you the best. I'll get right, right with you next. So we get you the best service. So um, your example, sir, is an immediate a need for a deputy. You're going to call. If it's if it's happening right then, you can call 911 or the non-emergency number and let's get a patrol deputy out there right away. How we work is we have a, we have a database of complaints and my deputies are responsible for working those complaints. So once we receive a complaint, we have to work it. You're going to get contacted from my office staff. They're going to acknowledge that we've received your complaint. They're going to ask for some specific information. We're going to be asking for time when it happens, what kind of issue you have, all those things. We're going to ask some clarifying questions because all that goes in the database. Then it's assigned to a deputy. Once that deputy has the assignment of that, the supervisor of that deputy is going to call you and say, I have received your complaint and I am working it. So we work complaint specific. So we if you're having a big racing is is kind of wide open so we leave that for our night guys and they'll come out in different times of the night for speeding say or the stop signs at gateway that they're running and not paying attention to or the no u-turns we would work a specific complaint so u-turns are really hard because that's hit or miss i can put a deputy out there and they're not going to they're not going to do a u-turn in front of a deputy or i can put a deputy out there and roll the dice maybe i get catch one maybe i don't but uh, we, we Remember, I had this countywide, so I have to I have to have some sort of enforcement mechanism to change the behavior. So if I if I go to a place and I'm not getting a volume of violations where I can write tickets and try to change behavior, and I need to move to another another complaint and try to move, try to apply pressure and get compliance on that one as well. So we work complaint by complaint. So your second. So I just want to clarify, patrol versus traffic. So you call in a complaint, we're going to work. No matter what you call it, we're going to work. Yes, ma'am. So I know you're working the racing on PFP, but are you walking the racing on Orangewood? Is that what I was going to ask? Yeah. Because my house was up to Orangewood okay. this past weekend. We had a really long series of racing for about a good hour. Yeah, they go in our clubhouse and parking lot. Okay. okay. So we have quite a bit of you, racing on Orangewood. Same thing. So if you know, if you if you have coming up from work or coming up from the store or whatever, and you start to see a gathering at one of your clubhouses. You need to call the sheriff's office so we can come investigate that. So, yeah. okay. So you yeah, make sure you continue to do that. I'll add Orangewood to it. We did not work Orangewood. Orangewood. Oh yeah. 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 We worked. We worked the, the main outside roads because we were trying to catch There's the, the really high speed ones. I'm just really kind of skipping questions. So is it like is it like a, a gang or is it is it just? It's a cooperative. It's a cooperative. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
when you, I'm going to give you the contact information, when you contact the traffic office and file a complaint for traffic, you will be contacted by my office. If, if you call, ma'am, if you call the non-emergency number, no, you're not going to get a call back. No. We're going to enter that call in to, into our CAT, our computer rated dispatch, and that's going to get a patrol deputy dispatched out there to try to address the problem immediately. I don't call the 836 call number. It's going to the same place. It's going to the same place, but you're not going to get a phone call back on that. I'm talking about if you have a, an ongoing complaint, you have a, the stop signs you're talking about, I'd be glad to send my motorist deputies out here to work those stop signs. That's no problem. If you send the information to the traffic office, you're going to get two phone calls from me. And, and I assure you that, that we're applying every bit of customer service that we can to address your issues and every issue traffic related countywide. But if you call the 911 or 836, that's going to a patrol deputy. And I need you to understand that somebody running a stop sign is important to you. It's also important to us. But if that deputy has a robbery or a burglary or a felony in progress, they have to go to those first. She's so, in the I get that. I get that, and I, I don't. I don't necessarily agree with that either. I don't. I don't think that that's that, that's the right way to do it. I'm just. I just need to, need you to understand the priority I of it. Course, that I we, you know, it could be. It could be. It could be a while before they come out to work a stop sign versus if they're having to work a felony. But the same thing with Orange Williams in Central Florida. Uh, we were talking about that right-hand lane. That, that you can go straight or right. People do not want to wait. They're mm -hmm. very impatient. They go into the central lane and then cut into traffic on Central Florida. Where are the deputies? I've called yeah. them that many times. There's no one sitting there watching that either. Until around seven, seven thirty in the morning. There's nobody there. So I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna give you an email and you're gonna send that to the traffic office because that's more appropriate appropriate for my office to handle than it is for patrol. Patrol is gonna come in, you're gonna call a complaint into patrol. Remember they have calls holding, they have calls they have to they have to deal with. My job is to deal with traffic only. I don't have calls I have to deal with. So if you call 911 or the non-emergency number and you say there's people trying to ride on red or they're not supposed to be, that deputy's going to drive out here because it's a call. He's going to drive out. He's going to go through. He's going to sit there for a second or two. Doesn't see anybody drive out, ride on red, and he's going to leave and go to the next call. I'm going to come out there and write tickets. My job is to write tickets to try to change behavior. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to give you three options to get me. Let me get that out for you, sir, real quick. I mean, just, just to reiterate with the stop time, I mean, I, I think I would like to see deputies there during the busy times especially. But I, I know what deputy she's talking about because I've witnessed it myself. She parks down in um, front of the Greenbrier sign, and a car runs a stop sign. She doesn't even look up. She could care less. And there's no point to this. Why are you here if you're not going to do anything? And they can't see her. They can't see that car until they've already hit the intersection anyway because of where it's parked. Um, I noticed that some deputies, they park like um, up on the median in front of the stop signs or the one on Orangewood. Everybody stops then, but if they hide down the street a little bit and watch, that's when you're going to nail them. Yeah. And I guarantee you, most of those people that are running those stop signs do not even live in this neighborhood. No, they don't. They're coming. They're yeah. not, they don't. They could. So, so I'm going to give you the contact information. Lee's going to take down this contact information and make sure we get it out to whoever needs to have this. I need this sent out to the entire the entire neighborhood. I'm telling you, uh, we've had a shift in the traffic section. If you've had a bad experience with my section before, it's different now. Okay, so we are providing customer service, and I want your complaint. All right, I'm not trying to avoid your complaint. I'm not trying to pass it on to Captain Scatero. I want your complaint. If you have a problem, it's a quality of life issue, and I want to fix it for you. Now, I can't guarantee that I can fix it every time. I can't guarantee that I'm not going to write one of you guys in here a ticket. But I will. I will respond to your complaints. These long-term complaints about running stop signs, things, they need to come to me. If it's an urgent, an urgent problem, they're congregating at the, at the clubhouse. They're doing donuts at, in front of your house or down the street from your house. Those you need to call and get a deputy out right away because we just want to run them off. I'm going to come and try to do a long-term solution. What's the phone number? 407. 836-0801. Lee's going to get this out, so you don't have to worry about writing it down. Okay. The email to come directly to my office, super simple, traffic complaints, with an S on the end, traffic complaints at OCFL.net. That comes to 19 people, gets that email. So there's a lot of people that look at that and go, oh, we got a problem. All right. The third way is our website, www.ocso.com. We're on the front page, traffic complaints. Click that button. 
and it ends up being shipped to the traffic complaints unit. Yeah. I just want to say thank you to the officers. Woo! I really appreciate it. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, let me let me reciprocate by saying thank you. Thank you on your community. I've worked out here three and a half years in this community, 25 years with the sheriff's office, and we we certainly feel the support from your community. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Captain Minnis uh, to address any helicopter issues. He's got some information. Oh, we save him for the end because there's a whole helicopter section. Okay. We'll do OCPS real quick, and then we'll go in straight to helicopter. And I was going to address the, the last the last thing here. Just want to let you all know your community is still one of the safest. Uh, the least um, least crime reports in Central Florida in Orange County. Um, we are sustaining from 2018, amidst all the growth that I cited earlier that you all see, we have sustained a 22% decrease from 2018 till now. So with the growth, we are sustaining a decrease. Our staffing for the area, for our sheriff's office, we've almost doubled. We've increased our, our staffing by 40%. Truth be told, we need to do that again, like yesterday, because the growth is so exponential. But we are trying to keep pace and get ahead of the growth, where your community still continues to be one of the safest in our county. Thank you. You know, I'm originally from up north. I'm from Philly. I knew, I may not have known their names, all of them, but I knew my local police. They would drive by. I don't really see that there. I, you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't see a lot of just normal coming in through the neighborhood, driving slow, staying high, looking at everything. And, you know, I mean, we still have some people that only spend so much time here, you know, or, you know, hey, I'm going away, watch my house. I, I, I don't get that at all. You know, we, yeah. we, will, we will certainly do, our, do our, our best to increase those frequent encounters in here. And I think. Yeah, and I, I, I will say this is just me putting in about in general. I, I feel like, and I know this is going probably before that, but you know, listening to you, I'm like, oh, that's great. You know what we'll do is we'll do a community event. And I'm like, if we do a community event, are we safe enough to do it? If we recognize me, it's a different difference last. So I'm really hopeful that we can do something that will get that engagement and we can plan something for the future. That was exactly what I was okay. thinking. Okay, that's good. I guess we will work on it. I think that's what's missing in today's world where it's, it's now, six months from now, after our traffic section comes in here and forces, you might not want to say, but we'll keep the good relationship. You know what I'm saying? Like, I knew all my neighborhood cops, you know, and we, there was just a, a rapport with everybody in the neighborhood. You knew Bonnie Clark. Yeah. You know, we walk off the street, we have a block party, nobody says nothing. You know, they make sure everything's okay. Anybody comes over to talk, you know, pal, that kind of thing. And I, I just don't get that. I don't see any patrols driving through the neighborhoods. They're, they're certainly here. And, and um, I, I agree with you. I, 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 I agree with and, and appreciate the, the opportunity to engage with the citizens by our patrol deputies whenever they can. Um, they are they are extremely busy. They don't come to work and sit around too often doing nothing. We certainly will. Trust me, I will look into what you all described because that doesn't sit well with me either. But generally speaking, again, let me remind you that your community, um, the public safety services assigned to your community are also responsible for everything along International Drive, up to Turkey Lake Road, Dr. Phillips, Daryl Carter. Um, so it's not, we don't serve just this community, but you are absolutely one of our top priorities. Mm -hmm. So we, we will do our best to increase that. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Next we have Orange County Public Schools. Hello. Hi. Do you need the clicker for this slide, or which slide would you like me to keep it on? You can put it there. Okay. Yeah, because I can't touch a few of the concerns. Okay. Good evening. Hi. Hi, um, Hi sir. Do I need to oh, stand up here? Hi. Uh, my name is Adam. I'm with Orange County Schools Transportation. Uh, I can't really speak to all of these points because some of those are outside of OCPS. But I know there was some concerns about bus speed that was sent to my office. Uh, we addressed uh, specifically because I did talk to a few residents on the phone. You might remember talking to Adam, somebody. I talked to several people who live here that may be here tonight. Uh, sometimes they've left a message because I'm, you know, a lot of places, but I've called everybody back on any concerns that came directly to me. 
investigate, I can look at the video, I can look at the GPS, I can see what's going on, buses are equipped with video, buses are equipped with GPS, very detailed information about speeds, about driving techniques, that we can address with the driver if we did address it on any specific complaints we had. General com concerns about speeding, we continue to monitor the GPS, we can pull a boundary report on the entire area of Williamsburg, which is what we do. I've uh, worked with our area supervisor, who's over the transportation for this area, manager of the drivers who drive around here. And we talked about how to pull those reports out of the system, do that periodically, do that weekly, a couple times a week. Look at the look at the statistics. What does it show? Does it show instances of speeding? It does. Address it with the drivers. We have a, we have a procedure for that. Uh, look at it a little bit over time after you've done some interventions. Make sure that they're following. Make sure that they're still not speeding. We want to. There's no excuse for school buses to speed. It shouldn't happen. You know, there's no reason for it. It's unsafe. Motorists can't speed. School bus drivers can't speed. I, I understand that. Uh, I was a school bus driver myself for many, many, many years. So I, I know, I know what it's about. So we are, trust me, I, I hear the concerns that were brought, we, we are addressing, we're continuing to monitor. I have to say, I've talked to Pam Gould before. Yeah. Um, she, you know, she's out of town, so she'll be looking here, but she did want me to also express that they are still, you're still hired and looking yeah. for drivers. So if there is anybody that is, you know, in your sphere or a sphere next to your sphere, who is experienced in that and looking for um, a position. They are, they are still a shortage. And I know that's caused, you know, a bumpy, a bumpy start to the year, which I think we all can understand. That you can't, until those people are hired and put in place, it, it's, you know, just gonna have to be patient with it. But that was uh, her ask. For, okay, and, uh, and, we, and we train too for the CDL license to become a bus operator. We've got a great training program. It great. sounded like there was a lot of bus drivers needed, like a no, lot. No, it's a, it, I mean, it's, yeah. It's yeah. A, Statewide issue. It, yeah, it, it, it's really. Everyone's hired. <laughs> yeah. Well, they didn't certify for so long, you know, once again, because of the, and people, there was this gap in the time that people were actually utilizing, and then boom, all of a sudden, you know, going back on. So, mm -hmm. I have I have never seen any uh, bus drivers or buses be, I don't know who we're getting the calls from. We don't want <laughs> I you to. Have, <laughs> I've, have, I've, I've had four kids, and two, thank God, now I would have two of them. But um, and so I've never seen the buses doing anything like that. That's that's just me. And I appreciate but that. That makes my night I, hearing I know, that. I've known I a bus driver now that takes my youngest in elementary school. I've known that same bus driver that used to used to take my high schooler that graduated this year. So I've known oh, that bus so driver cool. for ten years. So I love that bus driver. Good. Yeah, I've, I've had such good relations with bus drivers. Now the only thing that my concern was is um, the seating in the bus. Um, I've been told that they kind of scrunched um, in there, and I realized that it's because the lack of bus driver drivers. Um, like I said, I could be a bus driver. I don't know how they can handle it, so God bless them for that. But that's kind of a, an issue too. You know, the students are close to each other, and some of these kids are little. You know, they're, they're big. So. Yeah. So I don't know if that's something that you guys can, you know, look into. Yeah, we're doing the best we can. Like like we talked about. You know, when you have a driver shortage, that may happen. We do, we do what we can. I remember driving three kids to a seat. The, the bus is rated for 77 passengers on a full-size bus. Uh, we don't want to have to take that many, yeah. but sometimes the need arises. People like to use our service, safest mode of transportation for students is to ride the school bus. It's a big, safe vehicle. The drivers have a lot of good training, and good drivers. You know, they are. So it's understandable everybody wants to use it. It's so how, does, for it. How, do, how do they determine where the stops are going to be? Because I, I saw a bus stop being right in front of the top golf the other day, and I was like, that's a stop. Bus stop? Yeah. Like, it just looked weird to me. Like, I see the apartment. Where is the, yeah, so like, so, do they ever, like, how do they take that into consideration? I'm just curious. Yeah, here. well, sometimes it may be in a, in a location like that. But the thing is that if you go into a community, then is the bus going to be able to get out? Because some, sometimes you have apartment complex or something, there's not enough room to safely turn the bus around. You know, it's a big vehicle, it's about 41, 42 feet long. You need about 10 feet wide, you need about 12 feet of height clearance to get through there. It's dark. There's car parks. 
it, get, it, it gets hard to get in and out. So what I do in safety is I go out and scope locations for bus stops because I, I look and see, you know, sometimes the driver will feel like I, I, I can't get in, I can't get in there. So I'll go out and look and see, you know, having been a bus driver, I'll even get a bus and I'll go out there and see for myself how it is to go in about the time to go. You know, I do that because we want to keep it safe. We, yeah. we don't want we don't want to do stuff. Like that. And I had one other suggestion. I mean, they, when they were doing construction, they used to on Gateway. They used to pick up the kids at my clubhouse in Lime Street. I thought that was a great idea that they occupied the parking area because if you ever picked up a child at 3:40, you see the line of cars that are parked in front of stop signs and on the just on the grass of the street. I mean, I think it would make more sense if the bus drivers actually utilized the clubhouse parking. They have tons of room. There's kids. There's an area for the kids to sit. Don't have to worry about the bus making a U-turn. It just goes in there, and then it's and then it's out. And then it's out, and it's, out. And it's safer. Yeah, and it's safer because they're actually on it. And there's cameras in the clubhouse parking lot. You know what I mean? Like, they're Well, see, but I'm just saying, like, for, for all the clubhouses, all these villages have a clubhouse, and I just feel like if they can utilize the parking lot, because there's no one, there's really nobody there. I think that's really good. Idea. Is that an insurance problem now? I don't know. I don't know. They no, did it. They know. did it in the summer, and they did it when they were doing all that. Um, what was it? Oh, the gas thing. The yeah. gas things. The kids were getting picked up in, in our in our parking lot, and they were getting you know dropped off there, and it was safe. You know, easy for that bus to access right through. Yeah. So, I don't know. That's just a suggestion. I don't know. Okay. Thank, Thank you, so everybody. Much. Anybody else? Thank you, sir. Thank you. 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 Good evening. I'm Kevin Thompson. I am uh, the manager of aviation planning and development at the Great Orlando Aviation Authority. Does anybody know what the Great Orlando Aviation Authority is? Yep. Yeah. All right. Well, I work with them. Very good. So, the Great Orlando Aviation Authority, or GOBA, is tasked with the operation, maintenance, and administration of Orlando International Airport and Orlando Executive. We do not issue permits for heliports or helipads off airport property, and we do not control aircraft movements throughout the airspace. That is at the discretion of the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration. We do have informal noise abatement programs for both airports, and we engage the community through um, various noise abatement programs and uh, quarterly uh, meetings with the community to discuss uh, concerns throughout uh, the greater Orlando area. So the Federal Aviation Administration is the U.S. government agency that regulates all aspects of civil aviation. Air traffic management, certification of personnel and aircraft, setting standards of airports, and even protection of U.S. assets during launch or re-entry of commercial space vehicles. The FAA is the government agency responsible for aviation safety and has sole jurisdiction in the national airspace system. So let's talk airspace. Airspace can be somewhat complicated. So um, hopefully this image will better illustrate some things. Airspace can either be controlled or uncontrolled. Now what does that mean? So controlled airspace, you have uh, the FAA, uh, or air traffic control, providing air traffic control uh, separation services. So they're actually separating aircraft both vertically and laterally from each other and making sure that uh, there's safe separation between those aircraft and that green aircraft around weather. Uh, so Williamsburg resides under the Class Bravo airspace. So Orlando has Class Bravo airspace. That is uh, also known as an upside down wedding cake. If you look at it, it looks like an upside down wedding cake. So when you're looking right at the airport surface, the controlled airspace usually goes from the surface level of the airport up to a designated altitude. For Orlando International, our controlled airspace, the Bravo, close into the airport, starts at surface at the surface level and goes to 10,000 feet. So where Williamsburg resides is in Class Golf airspace. What is Class Golf? It is a portion of the airspace that has not been designated as Class Alpha. Class Alpha is basically when you're at cruising altitude, 
leveled off going in route to wherever your destination is you're flying commercially uh, is from 18,000 feet to 60,000 feet. Uh, Bravo, Charlie. Charlie is your medium-sized airports, your, uh, your Sanfords, your Daytona Beaches, yeah. your St. Pete's. So it's a smaller airport, um, still somewhat busy. And then you have your class Delta airspace, your Melbourne's, your uh, Kissimmee's, your Orlando Executive Airports. They're usually smaller, have a larger general aviation presence. This is the classification of airspace. So when we talk about what kind of airspace is above Williamsburg, it's class golf. Now this is what we call a sectional, uh, that basically is looking at the airspace uh, uh, for the greater Orlando area. You see how I mentioned earlier that Bravo, the inner Bravo shelf for uh, Orlando International starts at surface level up to 10,000 feet. So you can see that circle around MCO. It's five nautical miles. It goes from the surface to 10,000 feet. And you need to have air traffic control permission to enter that airspace. So where is Williamsburg on here? Does anybody see it? Yeah. Okay, right here near SeaWorld. You actually kind of see the cutout. So where does that exist underneath the Bravo? The Bravo airspace starts at 2,000 and goes to 10,000. So what does that mean for Williamsburg? Under 2,000 feet is uncontrolled. That means operators within the airspace could go anywhere within the realm of rules and regs set by the federal government. If they were to go above 2,000, they would need to go through the Bravo clearance, and they'd be talking to our air traffic control at the airport. Now this is a hot and cold map I generated just to give you a general idea over a 30 day period. I think this was the brand for um, most of August where air traffic is throughout Orlando. So you can obviously see where we're flying, right? You can see uh, our south flow departures, and our north flow departures. You can see the traffic around Orlando Executive. You can see some traffic around Kissimmee. And we can see where the helicopters are primarily So zooming in a little bit more, you see Williamsburg right here. Those are the locations of the helicopter tour companies and where they are flying, generally speaking. Zooming in a little bit more, this is for August. Again, you can see they're, they're concentrated pretty much on this power line. Um, I'm not sure if it has another name, I just know there's power lines there. So circling the theme parks and continuing on. So you do have at least three in this image uh, where you have some helicopter tour companies. So let's talk about other helicopters in the airspace uh, that you can see throughout Orlando. Uh, we have our Orange County Sheriff Helicopter Aviation Unit, which is based at Orlando Executive Airport. You have some news helicopters. You even have medevac helicopters as well. I took this image just so I don't block anybody. Uh, this was back in August 23rd, right? just afternoon. I was looking at where the flight tracks were that day, and I noticed a helicopter flight track over Williamsburg. It was this aircraft. It was a uh, Orlando Health uh, medevac helicopter that was going to ORMC. And you also will see some military activity as well. So let's talk noise abatement. Um, when it comes to noise abatement, there's a lot of different uh, industry organizations. I came across the Helicopter Association International, or HAI. Um, it's a trade organization. Uh, they are pro-helicopter aviation, but realize that they need to engage the community as helicopters create the noise. And so they created a noise abatement program. Uh, so I'll just cover some highlights on it. Fly Neighborly is a voluntary noise reduction program that seeks to create better relationships between communities and helicopter operators by establishing noise mitigation techniques and increasing effective communication. So Fly Neighborly is actually a cooperation between NASA and the FAA and talks about how operators are to conduct, um, how to fly their aircraft, different power settings, um, looking at the performance aspect to try to mitigate noise. And so I actually brought some documents to hand out if you want to engage HAI and talk about some noise abatement operations or uh, to, to interact with your uh, neighbors that have these companies, helicopter tour companies, to see if they would be interested in engaging and adopting this uh, noise abatement program, which would be voluntary. There's nothing you could really enforce with it. 
but it is, you know, it has some success elsewhere, so I just wanted to highlight it. So let's talk about low flying aircraft and what to do and how to report it and who has jurisdiction. So this is straight from the FAA's website. The FAA, again, as we mentioned, is responsible for aviation safety. When you have concerns about low flying aircraft, you want to contact the Orlando Flight Safety District Office. Somehow that got switched over there, my bad. Or FISDO for short. We actually have a location here in Orlando. And there's a phone number that was listed on that. I'm not sure. It's on mine. Uh, it's on yours? Oh, yeah. It looks like it somehow got cut off. Okay. Um, but I also listed here what information you want to have when reporting a low flying aircraft. So identification. Was it civil? Was it military? Was it a high wing or a low wing aircraft? Uh, what's the color? Do you have a registration number uh, or a, an N number? When you see an N number, that just means that aircraft is registered in the United States. So that's why it starts with an N. Time and place. When did the flight occur? Um, and what direction was the aircraft flying? Altitude, basically trying to gauge how high the, that aircraft was. And um, Sometimes you could base that off of an elevation of another object, maybe a cell tower or a small building. And then the noise abatement office for the FAA is actually in Atlanta for some region. So this is the contact information for the FAA. Do you have any questions that I could take in regards to helicopter operations? Perfect. Perfect. I don't hear them. That, that was I don't care. That was fascinating. If it's okay, to, I would love to have as a resource a sure. presentation. Yeah, and that's why yeah, we, that's we, we, we generated that. So. That's fantastic. Very good, good job. Thank oh, you. Yes, sir. I've got uh, a <clears throat> Which We live, I, we, I live on uh, Lake Willis Drive. We don't actually live in this community here, but we're on Lake Willis. Okay. And the helicopters fly over my house. Is it on here by any chance? Yes, it is. Like Willis. That, that route that you have right the there, they yep. come right over the top of my house from those two locations. I see. Instead of coming around where you have that uh, yellow line there, mm -hmm. they come daily and come over our house. I've got videos of it here. That's what I have my numbers. Have you reached out to the FAA with any of your concerns? So, so it's all in the realm of the federal government. Um, Orange County doesn't have jurisdiction in, in the airspace. The Greater Orlando Aviation Authority doesn't have jurisdiction in the airspace. So I would take those concerns and pass it over to the FAA, keeping in mind it is in a controlled airspace, that class golf airspace that I mentioned earlier. So they're not talking to air traffic control. Those flights are occurring within the federal aviation regulations. and. There's nothing that says that you can't fly over residential areas, unfortunately. That's just that's just how the law is written. Right over the top of the trees. Well if it's if you have concerns about the low flight, I would report it to FISTO. If it's if it's on top of your trees, I would, you could you could follow up with, with the FAA on that incident. Just again, on that on, on that last slide I had try to provide some, you know, time and place, uh, Describe the, air, the helicopter if you can. The more information, the better for them to be able to follow up on the incident. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. Hi, sir. My name is Tony Menace, and I'm the captain over the aviation section of the sheriff's office. And, uh, we obviously field some of these complaints. So I'm going to give you a little bit of information here, and uh, a lot of legalese here, so bear with me, but to help you understand the situation that we're in. Under 14 CFR 9113, which is the Code of Federal Regulations, so this is a federal law, deals with careless or reckless operation. No person can operate an aircraft in a careless or reckless manner so as to endanger the life or property of another. We don't normally enforce federal law. We enforce state law. So if you look down below it, there's Florida State Statute 860.13, 
which is the operation of aircraft in a careless or reckless manner. And it pretty much mirrors that law. It states that it's unlawful to operate an aircraft in the air, on the water, or on the ground in a careless or reckless manner as, as to endanger the life or property of another. So obviously, if we see something of that operation, then that, that becomes a concern for the sheriff's office. Now, here's where it gets sticky. Under that same statute, 860.13, under subsection 2, it's very specific. It says to convict, the courts must consider the standards for safe operation as prescribed by federal statutes or regulations governing aeronautics. So that, that's an important point there. So that's what the courts need to convict under something of this statute. So as stated in Florida statute, the courts must consider the standards for safe operation. Where do we get the standards for safe operation? I know this is um, this is what I deal with all day, so that's why it's, it's, it's kind of boring to a degree, but it, it explains it all in the long run. For the information, the Federal Aviation Regulations Airman, or Aeronautical Information Manual, we call it the FARAIM, uh, must be considered, uh, which deals with how aircraft are operated. So we go over to section 91.119 of the Federal, uh, the FARAIM, and it deals with minimum safe altitudes, which is a concern that people have brought up here. Except when necessary for takeoff or landing, no person may operate an aircraft below the following altitudes. It says section A, an altitude allowing if the power unit fails an emergency landing without undue hazard to persons or property on the surface. Over congested areas, an altitude of 1,000 feet above the highest obstacle within 2,000 feet of the aircraft. Section C, over other than congested areas, an altitude of 500 feet above the surface. Now, here's the caveat to all that. We're going to continue with this. Under subsection D, there's an exception to the altitude requirement for helicopters. So D states, if the operation is conducted without hazards to persons or property on the surface, a helicopter may be operated at less than the minimums prescribed in paragraph B or C. So that's where the enforcement angle from the sheriff, it, doesn't, it does not provide an enforcement angle for the sheriff's office is what I'm trying to get at. Not that there isn't an issue with low flying aircraft, not that there isn't an issue with noise. The problem is, where does the authority to deal with that lay? So what I'm trying to give you the basis as to why the sheriff's office can't deal with those problems. So they're not violating per federal statute and the Airman's Information Manual it specifically exempts helicopters from an altitude requirement. So provided each person complies with any routes or altitudes specifically prescribed for helicopters by the FAA. As Mr. Thompson told you earlier, this is Class G airspace, which is it's uncontrolled airspace. So there are no minimum altitudes or routes or anything prescribed down here. The operators, as a rule, normally have their routes that they'll follow, which I guess goes over the gentleman's house there, which happens to, to be an annoyance, which I understand. Uh, but there is no prescribed route or minimum altitude in this area by the FAA. Does that leave us all in the dark? Nobody can deal with this? No, it doesn't. So now we go to noise and low-flying aircraft complaints. The points he made earlier, the Federal Aviation Minister is tasked with handling these complaints. Noise complaints fall under the purview of the National Engagement and Regional Administration. As he mentioned, it's in Atlanta. And we do have a regional ombudsman, ombudsman for the southern region. They, they were nice enough to provide his information, his email address, and his phone number. So if anybody wants to write it down, or you can write it down off of that, or I can repeat it if you can't see it, I'd be happy to do it. Uh, if you get with me afterwards, I'll, I'll give it to you. So that's Reggie Davis. I would imagine he's a pretty busy guy because he's got the entire southern region. But the uh, bottom line is he's the guy for the, uh, the noise. And this is the main address, but that's in Washington, D.C. And they provide an email address. I'd say you'd probably have more luck with Reggie than you're going to have with that address. But once again, I can't answer for them. Uh, Low-flying aircraft complaints may be made to, and this is what he was referring to also, our local FISDO, which is the Orlando Flight Standards District Office, is over on South Park Circle in Orlando. And the phone number somebody was asking that earlier is 407-487-7000. Now, you've listened to me blab on about this, and, I, and it, it's, it's confusing to a degree, 
But this is the problem. It's problematic for us to do from an enforcement standpoint. Unfortunately, they're not breaking any state statute. And so we, we don't have any leg to stand on, per se, on those, those regulations. It's not that there aren't enforcement angles available. They're just not available to the sheriff's office. So as we are not, if you understand when you deal with the federal government, you have to be an affected party. So the gentleman over here with the complaint with the noise and the, and the low flying and all that, is he an affected party? Absolutely. So the, unfortunately, I can't make a complaint. The complaint has to be made by an affected party. So that's where these things become a little bit sticky. So even if you don't get this information right now from me, if you go to the FAA.gov, uh, it comes right off of their website. So that has the, the contact people, the information, who to speak to if you're not getting satisfaction. All of that is contained on that website. It's a wealth of information. Uh, but once again, I, like I said, I'm not trying to divert what I can and can't do. I just want you to understand that it's it's not an easy thing for the sheriff's office to remedy is what I'm trying to get at. So that's what I'm, I'm I, I feel your pain. I mean, we deal with these helicopters. We come down here for business. You know, we do communicate with the, the tour operators down here. And there's a lot of them. You know, there used to be in the old days, there was one or two spots. Now there's probably seven or eight that are constantly down here flying. And, and obviously over your house. So uh, the point being, is that I understand you have a complaint. And the only other thing I would say is over these areas, most of these areas, it's, it's other than congested is how it's looked at. If you think of 500 feet, it's not that far. It's not that high. Yeah. You, know, you go to that corner from over there, you know, you're, you're at 100 feet, and that's just five times this distance right here up in the air. So it's not that high. So it's kind of interesting. But then again, the feds exempt helicopters. So whatever their logic is, is I don't know what their logic is on that. There is no logic. But the, the enforcement angle where it specifically states that we have to refer to that manual, the AIM that I said, to get guidance on how to enforce that. If we, if we use a careless or reckless operation charge, courts can't just say, oh, that's careless operation. They have to look at the standards that are set by the FAA to judge whether or not it is appropriate or not appropriate. So all in all, like I say, it's 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 confusing, it's annoying. The feds aren't always the easiest people to deal with, but unfortunately that's the avenue that's available to deal with those. So I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have them. Good job. Thank you. So much. Is it like this may not be your purview, but like would it be possible for Orange County to pass regulations to allow you to enforce things? Or is that strictly the federal domain that we can't touch it? When it comes to aeronautics, the operation of aircraft, that's strictly an FAA. Uh, now, the, the county, I mean, depending on how they see things, certain things, they have an option, say, to regulate where they're putting teleports. You know, I mean, that's a, that's a permitting issue, things of that nature. I'm not that familiar with that portion of it, so I don't want to speak out of line on that. But that would be about the only thing the county would have any control over. And like I say, it's, it's done like that for a purpose. So you don't fly from Orlando, which says aircraft must do this, into the county that says aircraft must do this, because it would be a nightmare from a pilot standpoint trying to, okay, so it's, it's, it's an even regulation. This is how you'll fly. This is how you'll do it safely. And, and that's why it's under the federal purview versus the local. Now, I wanted to also introduce Erica with Air Force Fund because, you know, I really feel like there are companies that want to hear this feedback and want to be accessible to the community. And, you know, they're, they're making sure that their helicopter pilots are doing the right thing and staying the course along I-4. So I just wanted to go ahead and just give you the floor, Erica. Thank you so much for making the time to be here. And thank you, Sarah Nina. Yeah. Hey, guys. So I'm Erica. I've met a few of you guys in the past. I do recall our neighbors over here in Lake Willis. My, my father does live in Lake Willis. Um, so we understand we are living next to where we operate. So we understand the concerns of Lake Willis. And we understand Williamsburg. And ever since we opened up in 2013, 
we have done everything we possibly can to mitigate the noise in order to be successful with our business, but also try to be neighborly. Like all the other presenters said, the regulations are, are, are being met, we're following the regulations, and then and the enforcement aspect of it, there's nothing that we're doing wrong, but we would like to do the best we can to find a middle ground. So throughout all these years, we have always flown between 900 to 1,000 feet over the theme parks, approach and landings as much as we can. We try to show the theme parks. You guys are next to SeaWorld, so we do come around this area. As you saw in Kevin's presentation, we use the power lines and the hotels as our absolute boundary to not cross over. So a pilot uses that as a reference. We show the parks, we try not to fly over your house, and if there's any reason to do so, it must be an emergency, an exception, and that is not something that we do regularly. The same with Lake Willis. We don't want to disturb our awesome neighbors, and we do avoid that as much as possible, but we can't control what the other operators do. So in terms of the low flying, we know and we try to assist residents and other people in the past with the complaints to the FAA because we say something, it doesn't carry as much weight because it sounds like a competitor is trying to take down another one. In effect, I'd rather us work together so that we can all live amicably and there's still business, you know, enough for all the operators to be here. But if we work together with other operators and the community, this would be a much more pleasant experience all around for everyone. Um, we're not going anywhere. We don't want our business to fail. So I can't promise that we're going to stop flying. But I will always do my best to answer phone calls, answer emails. I work with Lake Willis. I work with Williamsburg residents in the past. I work with the residents around Orange Tree and the Universal area as well. They contacted me just recently because this year has been a really busy year out of nowhere more than before. So we went from no flights you know, in 2020 because of the pandemic to all of a sudden Orlando started booming again and it was unexpected. So I understand the noise did increase and right now it is leveling off again as I think we're going back into the seasonal hospitality Orlando schedule. So as soon as they contacted me, I, I look at that complaint we check the, the flight tracks. Anyone can go online and look at the tracks and see what helicopters are in the air at any time now. It's not a paid service. I don't have to have the GPS. I put in the past, we you know paid for that service because it didn't exist before. So we, we've done it in the past and now it's free for anyone to access and check out. Here's what's hel helicopters flying over. It's the black and red one, it's the blue one. You can tell who it is by the tail numbers and those colors. And then you go online and you can see the tracks that they're flying. So I answer the phone calls, I take a look. Let me make sure it wasn't one of my pilots. If it is, there's gotta be a reason. If it's a lapse of judgment or had to make that call, absolutely, all right, please don't do it again. Remember, these are no fly zones that we impose on our companies in our training and our pilots. So when it comes to Lake Willis, Williamsburg, Lake Kane, and the Orange Tree area, those are our company no-fly zones. And I have just recently adjusted the universal area and spoken to them and completely changed our flight route in order to still show the theme parks, but not fly over those neighborhoods that we're getting the heavier traffic. And again, that is the best that I, I can do, and I'm gonna continue to do so regardless if there's any enforcement or way to make us do it. We're doing it because we want to, and we're open to suggestions and, and ways to move forward. Um, and any help you know, with Orange County, with regulations, future airports, enforcement of the current regulations and the heliports that are here. Um, I'm always here, answer emails, phone calls, everything. It's me, my family business, my dad. So we're always here to help. So I know if there's some questions, complaints, Let's hear it. Please be kind. Of <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. All right. And now our neighborhood services division. I was going to say this is our neighborhood services division. <laughs> We're back on the ground. Here we go. Good evening, everybody. I'm Jason Reynolds, our, the manager of Orange County Neighborhood Services Division. My name is Jason Reynolds. I'm the manager of the Orange County Neighborhood oh. Services Division. Earlier this year, Mayor Demings 
merged our neighborhood services, the merged service, neighborhood service division and code enforcement division into one, into one division focused on engaging and strengthening communities. So with me today is Mr. Jordan Hodge. He is the code inspector for your area. Wow, that's quite an that's quite a presentation I'll try and keep it brief I know it's getting a little bit late uh, the first program I would like to highlight tonight is what we call the getting organized program and it provides resources for neighborhood neighbors to organize and become voluntary organizations I understand that some of you that some I this is uh, there are different groups in Williamsburg and some of you may be organized or some of you may be not organized but what is the one of the many benefits of this program is to address the challenges in your neighborhood collectively. So obviously this is a community meeting, there are a group of people here who see the value of people banding together to address concerns in your community. And I can tell you there is far more effectiveness when it's a group of people doing it than individuals, as evidenced by your commissioners here and all the stakeholders who are lying in this wall. If you, each of you tried to address these problems yourself, you would still be with 311 talking, you would have called 911, you would have called non emergency, you would have called the law, but when you're together, you bring all of us here to you. So that's how that program works. And even if you are organized, we do the refresher where we come back in, help you relook at your bylaws and your help you reelect leaders, help you with running meetings. We won't provide legal advice, but what we do is help you become a voluntary and effective, uh, an effective voluntary neighborhood organization. Next is our neighborhood beautification grant. I don't know if anyone, I know we've done projects here in the past, but it's probably been a while. This program is, offers grants for neighborhoods and organizations to, in, to beautify their entranceway. So typical, and the grants range from up to $10,000. If you are a mandatory homeowner association, there's a 50% match. If you're a voluntary group, there is no match. So if they're, obviously if you're mandatory, you pay dues, you have a mechanism, you can raise money and we put a match in place. If you're voluntary, there are no dues, so that's why we there's no match in place. Some of the typical projects we see are neighborhood signs. Well, that was on the previous side. Landscaping, hardscaping, repairs to walls. Uh, we do gazebos and playgrounds. The organization must own the property in that situation. And then we, uh, so the application process is resident will work with one of our staff people, we'll put you in contact if your voluntary goes one place, mandatory goes another, we'll help you with the application, you get three quotes, you have to put together a small project team, it's reviewed internally and in a, uh, in a, an advisor group, then it goes to the Board of County Commissioners, we have a brief orientation, we, uh, we, we put together the financial documents and you implement the project. Obviously, a vendor does that. Project is satisfied, you pay the vendor. It can be sometimes a little bit lengthy because right now, obviously, we know with construction materials, anyone doing any type of labor type of like, it's very hard, but we've seen success. This is an example of a neighborhood wall that was hit down. It came to us as a code violation. The resident who lives behind that wall, believe it or not, although they didn't build that wall, is responsible. We worked with the neighborhood to complete the application. Because the goal is, from the code side, which Jordan will talk about, the goal is compliance. From our side, our goal is to fix the wall. So there's no, we're not trying to run fines or any of those things, and we're not trying to make it difficult. So we have a process to fix that. These are the contacts for the program. I believe Lee, you probably circulate this. These are the contacts. Ruth, Jux, she's the one who handles if you are a voluntary neighborhood organization. Contact her. I believe she's contacting contacted folks in this neighborhood in the past. And Tabitha James worked with our mandatory neighborhood associations. So moving on to our, has anyone here heard of or been to the Orange County Community Conference? Lee was a speaker at the keynote speaker two years ago, but no one else? That's awesome. Yeah, Lee was a keynote speaker. Was it 18 or 19? I think it was 19. Where was that video, by the way? 
So Orange TV has it. Oh, okay. Uh, so our community conference is this coming Saturday, uh, sorry, October 16th, about a month from now. It's at Orange County Renaissance Center in East Orlando. And the conference is a day for residents, uh, resident leaders, nonprofit leaders, to attend workshops to learn how you can strengthen your neighborhoods and be more effective whether you're leading a neighborhood or a nonprofit, be more effective. Uh, we have workshops, there are community awards, vendors, essentially a day of networking. Imagine, a, so you all are dedicated neighborhood leaders, which is why you're here. Imagine a conference full of people just like you, and you're learning in workshops and learning from the speakers and learning about how you can better your community. So some of the workshops this year, uh, we're scale apps. Last year it was on, uh, online, so we're scaling it up a little bit differently this year for a sustainability update. I heard someone, I heard, I said I wouldn't give legal advice. There is an Ask a Lawyer <laughs> section where there is a, a lawyer who handles uh, HOA and neighborhood issues, and he can give legal advice because he is an attorney. Uh, we, Orange County and Na the Code Enforcement Neighborhood Services Division merged, so we'll talk about our vision and how we are focusing on compliance and starting to use a more customer service, neighborhood-friendly approach to gaining compliance with our codes. They'll give a full workshop about the Neighborhood Beautification Grant, which you heard about earlier. Vision 2050, which is put on by, which is a workshop from our planning division. That's the new, uh, Jason may have, the other Jason may have touched on it earlier, which is our, our visioning for the future, our comp plan, how we want to grow as a community oh, between now and 2050. Redistricting, which is upcoming, if anyone knows, this is the year where we, the commission boundaries are changed. It happens every 10 years. We'll do a workshop for people who wanting to become more engaged with that process and learn. And lastly, a chat with Mayor Demings. This is just an informal conversation. I sit on a stage, Mayor Demings sits right there. I ask him some questions about things going on, and then he just takes questions from the audience. This is our day of uh, community conference. This is how it works through the day. We have vendors. It's a great day of fun. I invite you all to be there and join us. Uh, so next, I will turn over to, I guess he needs no introduction. <laughs> I'll turn it over to Jordan Hodge. Can we get a round of applause for Jordan Hodge? All right, so it uh, sounds like most everybody's familiar with me. Uh, code enforcement. <laughs> My name is Jordan Hodge. I am your Code Compliance Inspector. Uh, I'm very confident in saying that if you have dealt with me in the past, I'm very front, uh, transparent, I'm very honest, and if I don't know the answer, I will find it for you. Uh, I always keep the lines of communication open. I'll give you my direct numbers, my desk phone, my cell phone. If I don't answer, I always encourage everyone to leave me a message. Don't leave me a message saying, hey, I did it. Come on out whenever. Hang up. I don't know who you are. So if you do have an experience with me, and I didn't call you back. Again, I'm not saying there's not a truth coming from this side, but you gotta give me a little bit of information. Your address, your name, a callback phone number, something, so I can update the case, reach back out to you. Uh, also, I guess you have to be smarter than the tool you were using. Point of that way, George. Point of that way, George. Excellent. <laughs> All right, moving forward, uh, let's talk about the role of code compliance, the types of compliance and examples that we deal with. Uh, First off is zoning. Uh, this is one of the more common types of complaints that we get. It covers a lot of bases. Could be something as simple as um, maybe uh, some construction without a permit. It could be an inoperative vehicle located beyond where my authority would allow me to sticker that vehicle. Uh, could be Airbnbs. Anyone familiar with those? There's my crew. All right, that's why everybody's familiar with me. Airbnbs. Uh, moving on to housing cases. This is. Uh, Broken windows, damaged driveways, cracks in the roof, I know, tarp roofs. That was a pretty hot button issue about a, about a year, a little, a little over a year ago. Uh, lot cleanings, pretty self-explanatory, high grass and weeds, trash, junk, and debris, things like that. Um, by the way, in order for me to take action for a lot cleaning for high grass and weeds, it has to exceed 18 inches in height. Just because it's tall, just because it's ugly, doesn't mean it's a violation. DMVs, okay, so this, if it is an inoperative vehicle located essentially from the roadway to the front of the home, I have the authority to address that vehicle, I can sticker that vehicle, and ultimately if the issue goes unmitigated, I can have that vehicle towed. Um, okay, so let's see, sweeps. I have been performing a sweep myself for the better part of probably four weeks now. 
I've been being more aggressive in the community. I've been coming every day, uh, spending more time than I normally would while still handling citizen complaints for the other areas that I'm responsible for. And what have I learned? Um, something I've always known, that Williamsburg, for the most part, is, is pretty good. It's pretty quiet. Um, there was a few issues here and there, but I'd say probably maybe around 15 new issues that I picked up just myself, um, which I guess leads me to my next thing. Um, if you see something, call it in. Call it in 311. Hold me, hold me accountable. Because if you see me in the street and you say, hey, oh, Jordan, um, you know, there's this house over on, uh, uh, you know, the one I'm talking about, and then you leave. If I don't address it, I mean, I'm human. Like, our interaction might end. You might go back in your house. I may be on the way to a priority call. I can't stop and jot it down and remember to go back. I may forget. So calling it in, yes. I mean, neighbor has a large tree that grows into the adjacent property. Are you talking about the branches or the roots? Right. Get a little ahead of me, but okay. Uh, so, 311. Everybody knows the number, yes? Yes. Everybody familiar with 311? Yes. No, really? Yes? yes. Okay. All right. So, example number one uh, in regards to the ability to inspect certain incidents. Neighbor has a large tree that grows into an adjacent property. Uh, your neighbor has a tall oak tree, really old, very large. Uh, storm comes, damages that tree, those limbs fall into your yard. Those limbs fall, maybe damage your vehicle that's also on your property. Who's at fault? Who am I writing up? You. Now, you may not be at fault, but all of my enforcement authority rests within the property boundaries, not where the violation was created, where the violation is actively occurring. If okay, you're so, so you have a branch that falls down during a hurricane and lands on somebody else's property, ruins their, their roof, who is responsible? The homeowner of the tree? Or no, you for, are. The for, the for, for code, for code where compliance, yes. Where the, also, where the tree essentially has fallen. If a limb is in your yard that's from a, their, their, their tree, you can cut that down because it's over your property. But. So your neighbor has a large oak tree, storm comes, Knocks all the branches into. I'm not telling you my name, but I have a large pine tree. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> I'm trying to get help. Anybody would like to help us see your citizen cut down a 45 foot tree? Well, I'm going to say, I'm going to bring this with this is not, he's not talking about homeowners insurance claim. He's not talking about. I'm homeowners. not a legal expert. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a judge. Code violation. That's yeah, I just done. don't know. I mean, I, I feel that those trees probably should come down, but I don't have $3,000 to take the tree down. Prevention is, I think, the best, but again, circumstances allow. But I hope I, hope I answered your question. We're talking to your neighbor. I talked to my neighbor. I, yeah, I was going to say, I think yeah. you can get a lot of ways from talking to your neighbor. Yeah, I talked to him. He'll pay half, but he doesn't want to pay half the freedom. Time to move on. Did, yeah, did yeah. I answer your question? No, but I didn't, I didn't answer your question. <laughs> okay. I don't know who's about to. Okay, so for just tree, let's just let's brain. just talk about code compliance. That's why I'm here. Yeah. So if I see tree limbs covering your yard, I'm going to write you up. Right. If I see that your vehicle has been damaged by said tree limbs, I'm going to write you up for that as well. Where the violation is actively occurring. Damaged and operative vehicle is on your property. Irrelevant what caused it. All the tree limbs are littering your yard. You're responsible. I, I have to jump in here. If the county is under an emergency order things get different, right? I mean, we all know that we, I, I lived here with a, like, a tree that was over my, like, cut off my road for I don't know how long until I got to my neighborhood. And it, you know what? Emergency order, storm. We said, to feel like there's right, storm. I'm not, I'm not here to, to yeah. scare anyone. Okay. Of course, like, yeah, right. Like, in, in the uh, case of, like, a natural disaster or hurricane, I mean, it's not my decision to make, but the last issue, we just suspended all code enforcement. I mean, you have to until there's a way. We we were so far behind in even helping collect. Yeah. We were operating uh, debris sites. Yeah. Oh, okay. So it's just things. So don't. I just know that this time of year, with storms coming, there's a level of anxiety. What he's trying to clarifying is very much specific code violations and how right. how having good relationship with neighbors is a good thing. <laughs> Maybe I should have said uh, everything. Maybe I should have prefaced this with under normal conditions. Yes, that's perfect. Right. <laughs> All right, let's move on to number two. Uh, the resident calls in a complaint to 311 regarding issues on the street and or county property. Again, all of my enforcement authority rests within the property boundaries of where the violation is occurring, with the exception of the streets, county properties, and the sidewalk. 
No. That is not me. You can absolutely call it in. If 311 transfers it to me, I will, I will uh, ensure that it gets to the right department. But I don't want you to call in a code, uh, excuse me, code enforcement issue, think that, or expect me to handle it, and then if you see me driving by, I'm not ignoring it. It's just, yeah. that's not my responsibility. All right. Limitations, legality of evidence gathering. OK, this is very important. So if you call a complaint in, I have to be the one to observe it with my own eyes. I also have to be uh, within, I guess you could say, legal protections. I'm six foot one inches tall. Pretty tall guy, right? Some fences, I know there's a no fence provision in the Orangewood PD, but uh, I can't lean over fences. If it's just a little bit above me, I can't with any, any aid put the camera up here, take the picture. I, if it's actively occurring, a violation beyond that fence, you know it's happening. Maybe everybody in the neighborhood knows it's happening. Unless, if I can't see it straight on, I can't address it. Now, if your neighbor, let's say, uh, has a dirty pool, inoperative pool, it's disgusting, harboring mosquitoes, etc. If you call the complaint in and you give me explicit permission to enter your property, maybe you can go upstairs, look out a second floor window, I can do that. I'm well within my legal rights to do that, but you again have to be comfortable with giving your information and allowing me entry into your home or on your property. Does all that make sense? Oh, again, beat this dead horse. Call 311 to report violations. Um, they're they're going to ask that you describe the situation, uh, provide the address where the violation, where the violation is occurring, where you see the problem, uh, and specify if the violation is more likely to occur at certain times of the day or during the week. Now, full transparency. I work uh, Monday through Friday, 7:30 a.m. to 4 p.m. Let's, let's face it, the reality is a lot of things happen when people get off work in the evenings and on the weekends. If you call, you know, the loudest voice gets heard. If you call one time, I'll absolutely come up to the property and chances are I'm not going to see it, right? It's not, it's not going to be there. I'll close that case, but if you call again and the issue becomes pervasive and I start to see, recognize a pattern, oh wow, this is, this is pretty serious, I can make special accommodations to come during those specific windows when you see these things happening. Uh, 311 will also provide you with a tracking number um, in case you're curious about the outcome of your complaint. How many times have you called someplace and then it seems like nothing happens? Oh, a week has gone by, two weeks, a month. Oh, they don't care. What, what are they doing? The answer is nothing. Not always the case. Again, when I see you, or if you call me, you email me, I will give you all of my direct contact information. You can bypass that. You can reach out to me directly. Say, hey, I call this complaint in. What's the story? What's going on? I will give you all that information. No problem there. That's why I'm here. Uh, yeah, and then once again, uh, you now know me, Jordan Hodge, the code inspector. That is my desk phone. Uh, I can also give you my cell, and that is my email address. And please, if I don't answer or don't respond, leave me your name, the address that you're calling about, and a callback phone number. A lot of people call from restricted numbers, and they'll say, hey, it's Jim. Yeah, you know, I talked to you the other day. And then they'll hang up. If I have no way to trace that call, for lack of a better term, or reach back out to you. I'm not trying to ignore you. Yes, sir. Um, I think I remember uh, a few months back, uh, uh, and it's a couple of phone calls, in which you talked to you, that you were going to start writing some violations for the tarps on the roof. Is that correct? OK. Oh, boy, tarps. I, um, I get it. I had to sue my insurance company after the last guarantee. Yeah two years, and they didn't settle until we were ready to go to the court. Right. We did depositions and everything. And then all of a sudden, they wanted to settle. Right? Yeah. But it's, it's been long enough now. <laughs> OK. So uh, I'm going to do my best to not yeah, overstep my bounds here. Uh, but again, I like being in the hot seat, especially this one. OK, so <laughs> if it's just a tarp on the roof, if I can't, again, jumping back to the previous slide, if I can't see and confirm with 100% certainty that there is damage beneath that tarp, I will not write it up. Really? And you can't go take the tarp off. Whoa, no, 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 no. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, I didn't mention this before. We both know. I mean, you see it. 
Ah, ah, there. Uh, what was that? We both know. Again, I've been sitting there for going on three years. Maybe I just like a blue roof. You know, maybe I'm sick of the tiles. Maybe, maybe Home Depot is taking too long to get the stock in for me to fix this. Maybe I just like the blue. It's kind of my thing now. Again, 100% verifiable. I have to be able to prove that the violation actively exists. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right, so um, the only thing, well, it's not showing up, but there's a video of some updates that Universal Studio sent us. There's like a video of some of the road work that's going to be done. I'm going to email all of the emails that I have. I think, Donna, you have everyone's email, right? And then I have all the village uh, board members. And mine too. And yours. And I'll send this PowerPoint and all the notes and everything that I took. If you have any questions, please let me know, and I'll make sure you get everybody's contact info. In the Hilton Bay Greater Orlando Aviation Authority, left some information back there on the presentation right. about the contact level with the FAA. You know, so there's some resources back there. We'll we'll scan our copy of that and have it online. So if you don't grab one, then we'll have it, and you can share that on my webpage and on on social media and wherever. The easiest way is for you all to access it. I want to thank everyone again, presenters, our um, residents, and if you have any questions, this is a good time. But I am conscious that it's gotten late, so don't wait around if you don't, if you have to move on. But thank you so much for coming out again tonight. Thank you for all coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.